morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome from Scottsdale, Arizona, the home and headquarters of Global Chamber. And you're wherever you are. Thank you for dialing in from around the world. We have a really important and fun conversation today about uh, entertaining and uh, engaging international visitors to your location. And we've brought together some really outstanding experts uh, for, who have global knowledge and experience who will share their their experience and some tips for you uh, in, in your business or whatever organization you're part of. Uh, my name is Doug Brunke. I'm the founder and CEO of Global Chamber, and I encourage you to be global and unstoppable. Uh, a person that I know that is global and unstoppable is Gloria Peterson. She's our first speaker today. She is the founder of Global Protocol. One of the great things about Gloria, I've known her for many years, she's not just an expert on protocol and etiquette, but she's also outstanding in terms of just basic professionalism. What's, what's it like to be a professional? And she has been teaching it. She's been certified in all sorts of both protocol and professionalism trainings over the years, and you're gonna really enjoy Gloria. Gloria, welcome to Global Chamber uh, on our conversation today, and take it away. Thank you, Doug. Am I? <laughs> we have to do a little height difference here. <laughs> Let's start out with um, talking about challenges. It is challenging to understand the cultural etiquettes, the nuances, uh, protocol expectations of every country, every region, and every tribe. Your first step is being here today to learn about the experts that have gathered. As a result, you will be better prepared and sensitized. Success in any situation is based on showing respect and being flexible and being adaptable. We at Global Chamber want you to be as well-rounded as possible. Realize that etiquette's code of behavior and pro etiquette is a code of behavior, sorry, and protocol is about procedure. These are extremely important components to building relationships, a relationship foundation. It grows from there. There are numerous books online and resources available, but you best learn from people experts as they share their experiences and or their cultural differences. At this time, I would like to introduce my colleague, Melissa Werner, we are both graduates of the Protocol School of Washington. Melissa Werner is Director in the Office of University Events and Protocol, Director of University Ceremonies, and a Protocol Officer at Arizona State University. Melissa. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, everyone. Again, as Gloria said, my name is Melissa Werner, Director of Ceremonies and a Protocol Officer at Arizona State University. We have a very brief time together, and so there's not going to be time to learn everything that we can about protocol, even after a week at the protocol school. There's still so much that I don't uh, know personally. So um, we'll go to our first slide. And so Right now, if, if you're thinking about what is it about protocol, if you've had no formal training, what you need to know is that that's not uh, uh, a hindrance to what you need to know. Protocol is really in everything that we do, and people want to know how do you do protocol and how does it fit into what I do every day. Can we now slide? So what I usually tell people is when we're talking about protocols, you don't know what you don't know. And so everybody recognizes when something is done wrong. You may not know exactly what the protocol is, but typically we can recognize what's going wrong in a situation if you, have a, if you see something happening. But no one really teaches you these things. So for example, when I teach students, I talk to them about the fact that when they're interns and you go into a room, nobody teaches you where to sit when you enter the room. You know instinctually that uh, you're not the most important person in the room. You shouldn't be sitting at the head of the table. You just kind of understand those things. So protocol happens in a lot of what we do. The other thing that happens every day is no one's taught you how to shake hands or make introductions, but these are all part of the things that we talk about in protocol. Next slide. So a lot of the questions that I always get are, what's the difference between protocol and etiquette? So protocol really is that sort of um, the science of what we're doing. Etiquette is the art. So for example, etiquette really has a lot to do with culture. 
uh, the way people interact, things that may happen in one culture that another culture may not do. Uh, you may not shake hands, you may bow when you greet one another, uh, people may sit in a particular order in one part of the world and the protocol may be, or the etiquette may be to sit in a different order in another location in the world. But the protocol of it all is what gives us the guidelines, the things that we know that will help uh, formulate that set of structures around what we're doing. So protocol is more of a science and really that uh, general description that we give about the protocol is the governing of affairs of diplomatic occasions. It sounds a little more lofty, but there really is protocol in everything that we do. And once you know some of those protocol guidelines, uh, it gives you a way to interact with people. So there is protocol every day. Things that we do in our businesses all the time, making introductions, shaking hands, giving gifts, again, seatings at me meetings and dinners. And so these are things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives that really are part of protocol. We just don't always recognize them as that. Slides? So when we start talking about protocol, one of the cornerstones, the foundations of protocol is this idea of the order of precedence. So we have precedence in government, a lot of people understand that, heads of state, senators, people at a higher level within government. We have protocol within communities, uh, the way we interact with one another at the community level, again, elected official or um, officials that are designated into different areas within community governments. Uh, school boards, all those types of things have precedence. And then within business, definitely within business every day, people have orders of precedence and protocol. The CEO as opposed to the vice president, the manager, any of those things in the way we operate. And then within family, and this is one that I like to talk to our students about, uh, we have protocol in family. So if anybody ever uh, sits at a family dinner, and there's a way that everyone sits. Again, nobody teaches you how to do this. Uh, typically, if you're in a very traditional household, head of the household, father perhaps sits at the head of the household, um, the mother to the, to the right. Um, but even within blended families, uh, same-sex families, there's sort of a precedent. There's a, there's a role in the way that we do these things. And those are precedences that we uh, adhere to. So when I uh, talk to students about that, I always ask them about those precedences and those roles within their own organizations as students and families and those types of things. So determining precedence really is based on position, uh, date of rank or appointment. These are the typical ways that we determine precedence. Length of service in an organization is sometimes used to determine precedence. And then default is always alphabetical. So the reason I talk about these things is because this is what helps us start to formulate uh, when we have visitors that are coming to see us. We have large delegations that come in. We need to know who uh, has rank or who has precedence within that group. So that idea of precedence is really kind of is important. So again, we're going to place people into categories. Are those people C-suite members? Are they managers? Are they project coordinators? Is there one higher level person that's bringing in a group of managers with them? So maybe a vice president is coming with somebody else. If you have a group of visitors that are coming to see you and they give you names, but they give you nothing else. It's You can't determine what the precedence is. So when it comes time to make introductions and make certain that the, that the um, president of the company or the CEO of the company is meeting up and sitting with that similar CEO, you need to know who those people are. So that's why we want to make sure that we know about the precedence. So again, when we're talking about visitors, and this is what we, I do a lot at ASU, we have visitors, we have delegations that come into the university. Uh, you want to know, you want them to know everything that they need to know. You don't ever want to assume, oh, they've been, for example, here in Arizona. They've been to the university. When people come to Arizona State University, it's a really big place. We need them to know where they're coming, even if their uh, English is very good or assuming that their English is maybe not as fluent you need to provide all of those details. So you're going to make sure that they know where they're coming, the building, uh, and you want to make sure that there's a single point of contact or someone who's going to be with that individual or group for the day. Uh, we've had this happen where delegations have come to the university and no one has been assigned to that person. And then they'll call and they'll say, I'm somewhere on campus, I don't know where I'm going, uh, I don't know what building I'm supposed to be entering. And so that just starts your visit off on the wrong foot. You really want to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. If you can, you want to make sure that you create an agenda. You actually should create an agenda for that leaves time for your delegation or your visitor to have breaks, to have meals. The time is critical. 
you won't have a lot of time. You need to cover a lot of things. And I've been handed an agenda where there is absolutely no time for people to get a drink of water, to use the restroom, to make a phone call. And you've basically run them through the day because everything is critical and everything is important. So you want to make sure that you're uh, putting an agenda together that gives people that sort of time to give them some a break in the day, maybe a moment to write some notes. You've been giving them a lot of information and you want them to have that ease of, of transition when they're going from one meeting to the next, meeting the next group of people, getting their business cards in order. So create agendas that give time to do all of those things. And then for um, visitors who maybe, again, English is not their first language, they're coming to visit you here in the United States, for instance, you want to make sure that you provide materials that are translated. And if you need to, provide someone to do on-site interpretation. This is critical, and again, when you're building your agenda, if you have to have someone doing interpretation, you need to build time because it takes time to ask the question, translate the question, get the response. So if you think, I can do a, a pretty technical meeting in 45 minutes and you have to do translation, immediately build another half hour into that schedule because you won't get through everything. Professional interpretation, professional uh, translation services are critical because I'm a fairly fluent Spanish speaker. I can sit down and have a meal with you and have a conversation, but I'm no way qualified to do technical translation if you start to talk about things that are very specific to your business. So you do want to make sure that you invest that time and effort into making sure that you have somebody who can do professional translation and professional interpretation services. Translation is materials translated from one language to another. Interpretation is on-site person to person. So when you talk to somebody and they say, I'm a professional translator, but you're now you're handing them written materials, they may not be as qualified. So you wanna make sure that you understand the difference between professional translation and professional interpretation. So with that, again, we have a very short amount of time. I wanna make sure everybody has a moment. But for your library, I've recommended some books, things that you can put into your protocol library that will help you prepare for visitors when they come. Um, a way to get to this information is obviously having the book. I have several of these books. I have a protocol library in my um, office, and these are all very, very useful. Uh, I in included the United States protocol in there because, again, sometimes we are dealing with businesses that deal with uh, military officials or former government officials, and you want to know what that precedence is and how they're to be treated. Um, I can't say enough good things about the book Honor and Respect by my colleague Robert Hickey. Uh, very nuts and bolts, uh, this is the order of precedence, this is how you address people, this is how you address a letter, this is how you address people in conversation. Really good information. And then uh, Multicultural Manners and some of those other books. Uh, I am the Vice President of Events for Protocol Diplomacy International Protocol Officers Association. We would encourage anybody who has <clears throat> questions about protocol to reach out to this organization. There is a number of speakers and resources on that site as well, people who can help you out regardless of where you are in the world. So this is a really good um, uh, link as well to get some information. And then the last link that I have for you is the CIA World Factbook. Now this will give you some general information, if, especially if you're taking an outbound delegation into, into a country and you need to know about that country, the government, the structure, uh, maybe what their major resources are, uh, where they are in the world. This is a really good uh, just general fact book. What I would strongly recommend that if you have any questions, don't rely solely on the internet. You do want to speak to your local diplomatic corps, uh, an embassy if you have one in your area. Uh, go to the people who are from that area or who work in, and live in that country that you're trying to deal with, either inbound delegations coming to you or outbound delegations going uh, to that country. So those are just some basic, basic um, pieces of information. Quickly running through those. Um, it's really next what I want to do. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce you to Dialva Ward. Dialva is a Hopi Paiute shaman and spiritual teacher of Arizona. Her Hopi name is Dawa Mana, which means sun maiden. Her clan relations are butterfly and badger. As an indigenous practitioner, she incorporates her cultural practices to provide life purpose guidance, spiritual transformation, and energy work for the physical body. She will be sharing Native American protocol considerations that should be respected when being received as a guest at a meeting or an event. And with that, Yalva. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning. Um, 
My name is Dialva Ward. I am a Hopi Kaibab Paiute, and I'm from Old Arabi, Arizona. And my grandfather is Franklin Dry. Grandparent, uh, grandmother is Yoberta Dry Height. Um, my clan is Badger Butterfly Clan. Um, I'm also an indigenous practitioner, and my business is Earth Mother Wisdom. The reason for that introduction is a typical introduction you would get from a traditional person done in their uh, traditional language. So by doing it in English, you get an understanding of what I am saying, because there are three important um, connections when uh, being greeted by a traditional Native American. It is the respect, the honor, and the spirituality. So each time we are greeting people, we come from that perspective of the respect, the honor, and the spirituality. Um, as a business sense, it is important for you to understand and know your Native American guests by knowing if they're traditional, modern, or traditional and modern both. Um, when you recognize that is a clear sign is when a person is introducing themselves uh, in a traditional way, in a traditional manner, your etiquette would be approached by in traditional ways. If the person is greeting themselves in a modern way, uh, you would definitely use your American etiquette and protocol in greetings. It really is acceptable at that time. If you're unsure if your Native American guest is uh, traditional or modern, then you would go with the traditional uh, interconnections with each other. So one of the typical greeting connections that most people have is about the eye contact. Um, having eye contact, meeting uh, a Native American guest is, um, can be unacceptable directly, depending if you're traditional, if you're modern, uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, but if you're unsure, you want to look to their ear to the right or their ear to the left, um, keeping a level head at all times, but not direct eye contact. When it comes to shaking hands, depending on um, if the person is uh, a chief or a tribal chairman or a medicine person, you wouldn't necessarily always shake hands. Um, sometimes they would just nod, um, but extension of the hand will let you know if the reciprocation is displayed. If the shaking of the hand is extended and that particular Native American guest does shake your hand, um, a light to medium handshake is acceptable. Um, make sure that your hand does not touch their shoulder or their back. Um, that is considered disrespectful. When you're guiding them into a meeting or into a chair, you do not touch them as they're going, but utilize your hand gesture in a motion to escort them into a room or escort them into a chair. Um, the other connection when you're dealing with your business people is body language. Um, when you're opening up your body language, Native American people watch for that and become more comfortable when you become comfortable. So is that, that personal interaction is when you open up the body language with the hand. If you're having the crossing of the hands or the crossing of the legs, it tends to be a closed off connection. And your Native American guest would be a little more hesitant to proceed uh, through the meeting. Um, the other thing that you want to be open and mindful of is um, when you're introducing your Native American guests, the appropriate protocol of how to introduce them would be through tribal affiliation first. If you don't know that tribal affiliation, then Native American would be more acceptable. Um, the other connection would be depending on if you're having a meeting with your uh, Native American guest, if they're in your area or your location or your office, the traditional connection would be just the greeting in itself. Um, the mannerisms would be more open on uh, American protocol. But if you're on their reservation, the traditional connection would be um, to follow what they're showing you and guiding you to do, um, whether it's with a meal or whether it's with typical conversation or ceremony that they may have and follow through. 
Um, it is always important to do research ahead of time to decide um, if this is a traditional guest that you're having or a modern guest that you're having. Um, when you have a modern guest um, time frame it is not such a, a big deal because that particular guest will be there on time and be respectful of the time frame that you have. When you're dealing with a traditional person, be flexible with your time. Uh, be flexible with um, them appearing to you at your meeting and the time frame that you will have. If you're having a meeting and scheduling it, trying to get out within an hour, um, it may take a little longer because traditional people tend to speak with um, storytelling um, and being able to communicate um, what they're trying to get across. Um, and at this time, that's all I have to offer you. If you have any more information um, that you're seeking on Native American protocol, you can connect with me on earthmotherwisdom.com, and I'm turning it over to Greg. Wow. I, I think one of the questions certainly is how, how have we hopefully not insulted you today? So you gave us a lot to think about uh, in terms of how, how, how to deal with Native Americans. Uh, and uh, our next speaker is also very well uh, acclimated to another culture. Uh, Mark, uh, our next speaker, is Honorary Consul for Japan. He's based in Birmingham, Alabama. He's also Global Advisor for Global Chamber. Uh, Mark, thank you for your service. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, and so what's kind of cool about you is you've got the cultural side of it, but you develop the cultural side through your business interactions. You formed uh, Morrison conferencing in 1996 and then in 2015 Mark formed Clarity Global Health Systems. In 2017 Mark has received the Samuel Ullman Award for exemplary service to the Japan Alabama uh, relationship. Mark thank you for all that you do and we look forward to hearing about your view of how to do business in Asia. It looks like your location is a little bit more outdoorsy than ours today. <laughs> I chose the backyard. The backyard. Okay, it looks great. Alabama. Uh, exactly. A little warm, but uh, we won't be here too too terribly long. Yes, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the, uh, the other bits of information. I agree with you. You have to make sure that uh, not to insult the Native Americans. It's a, um, it's a culture that is rich in tradition and history, just as Japan is. Uh, what I have found with uh, Japan is that there is a true high degree of respect that we have to show to Japanese because the Japanese will inherently show that respect back to us. Uh, in business as well as in diplomacy, consular affairs, what I have found is that if it is your meeting, if it is your show, it is your show. You must be in complete control. Uh, certainly there are people that will help you set this meeting. There are people that will provide you information, but you are the master of ceremonies. You are the center of the attention. The art is to make sure that no one knows that you know that. Such as whenever you go to a restaurant, where do you choose the restaurant? Uh, you don't ever choose one haphazardly. You don't ever just go to an Applebee's and sit in the middle and uh, one, it's too loud. Two, you're not familiar with the server. The server has to be shared with other people. Go to a restaurant that you, that you know, that you know the owner. Uh, here in Birmingham, I have several restaurants that we choose. One of them overlooks the city of Birmingham. It's a beautiful view. It's a view that you only get from that location. But what happens is when our visitors walk in, they're immediately wowed. How do you set a table up? I get that asked all the time. Set it up very intentionally. As the lady spoke a while ago, you need to know the hierarchy of the people who are there at lunch with you. Um, I've never been a fan of sitting in the middle of a long side of a table. I'm at the head of the table. One, because everyone can see you, you can see everyone without craning your neck around. But then also, you get to decide the placement of everyone else based on their hierarchy. I always go to where the most important person 
that's to my right. And then build from there. Usually the most important person from the foreign delegation is to my right. The most important person from the local delegation is across the table from you. And you build that table going down, whether it's three people or 30 people. But also, you must be able to control that environment. You need to make sure the servers know you, they know what you like, what you need, and they have to be apprised of how important this, this lunch, this dinner, this meeting is. One of the things that you find out in a lot of cultures is the placement, the importance of women. As I mentioned, the Japanese and the Southern, the Southern protocol here, the Southern hospitality gives, gives respect to everyone. However, in many cultures, unfortunately, women are secondary. You need to know that beforehand. However, as a Southern boy here, everyone gets my respect to the degree that, that it can be allowed in certain cultures. Now, the interesting part, as you mentioned a little earlier, is I am a business person as well as a diplomat. I found that those same exact rules apply in a business setting as well as a diplomatic setting. But you better be able to know what you want to get done in that meeting. Is it a contract? Is it to settle a, a dispute? Is it to uh, introduce folks to a high-ranking official? Knowing what you want the end game to be before you go in is necessary. The other thing that you need to do is make sure that you understand a bit of the language. I can speak French and Russian, but I didn't say I speak Japanese and I represent the Japanese the state of Alabama. Well, I'll tell you what I did, a quick little story. I'm allergic to mushrooms. So I learned the word for mushroom. Second time I went to Japan, I spent five days in Tokyo. And then I left to go to a banquet in my honor, in one of our sister cities, Hitachi. When I was in Tokyo, every time I'd sit down for a meal, I would let the waiter know that I was allergic to mushrooms. So whenever I got to uh, Hitachi, I was sitting at the head table and the waiter came over and I told him, this, 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 no Kenobi. And he said, Kenobi? Yeah. The mayor leans over and he says, Mark son, I know Kenobi. But I'm allergic. He said, ah, English, please. I said, to mushrooms. He said, Mark son. Kenoko, mushroom. Kenoki, small children. So I had been telling people for five days down in Tokyo, I was allergic to small children. Those small little, little details cannot be overlooked. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Thank you. For not eating any small children <laughs> while, while you were in Japan, uh, that would definitely be a, a faux pas. So uh, we have a number of questions, and so ladies, if you don't mind coming up and 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 please step onto onto the scene here um, as as you can. Um, one question is American culture versus other cultures, and the importance or lack of or relative lack of importance in the American culture. Would anyone like to talk about, you know, the, some of the things we're hearing in the Native American community in Japan, China? The, these are countries that have long and 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 people that have a long history. And is it the fact that America is a young country that we don't seem to have as, as many of these protocols and etiquettes? Or would you view it that we have many and, and, and we actually know them very well and we follow them? So how would you compare the U.S. and American business and etiquette and culture and protocol with, uh, with other countries? I think I take that. Okay, come on over, Gloria. Okay, I think one of the challenges we've had in the United States is we were – built on a very traditional way of doing things back going back to 1776 as this country was developed and we were on a very traditional page of etiquette and protocol one that was pretty much recognized around the world 
Then the 70s came, and lots of things changed in the 60s and the 70s, and we became a, what, the best way for me to put it, a very gendered environment to a very non-gendered environment. So the way you treat women and handle women in the business community changed. And it's not about gender in business anymore. It's about showing precedence to somebody of rank or showing deference to rank. We also have a traditional form of etiquette and protocol in this country that we need, everyone in this country needs to know whether they're on the modern page or not, because you're going to have to adapt. In some countries, some of these things are still practiced and observed. In our country, the more modern approach might have changed that, but it doesn't mean it changed around the world. So we have to be very, very careful. Also in our country, um, as Mark implied, uh, we have regions. And the southern region is probably the more traditional of all the regions. They are the most traditional, absolutely. As far as the world women play in business, how to treat women, opening doors for women, there's more an expectation there. But if you do that in Chicago, where I'm from, you might get the door slammed on you. So <laughs> it's, it, it, it's changed. But just be adaptive and realize there are two rules of thought here. One is traditional that everyone should know. Modern is more the page that the business individual is on, maybe not so much socially. Mm -hmm. And Melissa, if you want to add to that. Um, yeah, I think what I would say is we're, we're in the United States, we are uh, very egalitarian. We like to think of ourselves as everybody sort of being on the same uh, uh, level to a certain extent, but we understand uh, again instinctually that that's not necessarily the way it is all the time. Uh, but in general, we we like to see ourselves when we established ourselves as a country that was getting away from monarchs and getting away from hierarchy. And and uh, over the course of time, it, we understand that there's importance to that. Uh, but in general, the United States, I always tell my students that uh, we're very we're very American in the way we approach people. Everybody's a friend, and we're opening our hands, shaking hands for the most part to everybody, and uh, that's not always received in the right way. So we do have to make sure that we're cognizant of who we're dealing with and, and what their traditions and what their cultural um, uh, etiquettes may tell them about the way they interact with us. So, Galvin? When it comes to uh, Native American um, connections, uh, we're opening up more. Um, back into the 60s and 70s, we were not open with our relations and how we communicated with the community because it, we weren't uh, welcomed as we are today. And so with the, the technology and connections, we're able to uh, put that information out and share that and educate people on um, we are still holding our traditions to this day. And we're teaching our youth as they grow and evolve into government and business that we still stand strong with our traditions. Could, while you're there, uh, could I? one of the questions is regarding that traditional modern uh, split. So this is Doug asking the question, sorry, a bit off screen. So you talked about how, you know, largely how we'll behave in a meeting, let's say, uh, is, de is determined by whether the people or the, the key person is more traditional or, or more modern. How, how would someone be able to, to know that ahead of time? Um, being able to, like, the, like I introduced myself earlier, is now being more modern, we will introduce ourselves in a traditional way if we want to be um, come across more traditional. So if, if I'm coming to you as, as a business person and I come off very traditional, I'm going to present myself in a traditional way. If I'm more open to the modern way of etiquette, then I would present myself in a modern way. And I think that's going around with a lot of uh, American tribal communities is that we've learned that we have to communicate with businesses and governments in that type of uh, connection. Okay. Uh, Mark, you touched on that a little bit about tradition versus modern. And what I took out of what you said was, you know, that maybe we in the U.S. can get away with certain things like how you would treat women. You know, traditionally, women have not been treated very well. And so when we entertain guests, we have the opportunity to, quote, unquote, educate people. And so we have to be, I think, be very careful on how we select the opportunities to quote unquote educate. But do you ever, and, and was that what you were intimating, that you try to kind of push the envelope a little bit in terms of opening some of the more traditional thinking uh, to be more open to gender roles, for, for example, or diversity? Yes, you're exactly correct. Uh, as I said a while ago, it's your show. 
you better know your stuff before you start the show. And as, as you mentioned a while ago, uh, here in the South, regionally, we are very much built on respect. However, we also understand and practice a lot of hierarchy. My father taught me that you pay attention to everyone that walks through your door. Once they walk through your door, you will then have an opportunity to figure out who is the number one person. And then you go with that. But you never, never, ever show any non-priority to someone simply because you think they're not a priority. Don't ever prejudge. Gotcha. Uh, Gloria and Melissa, how do you kind of pre-set and how do you find out kind of on the traditional modern scale? Because you're, you're going to adjust your behavior, presumably, based on that. Are there questions that you ask? Do you ask other people? How do you, how do you find that out about visitors that are coming? in that preparation, which yeah. you talk a lot about, mm -hmm. Melissa. Well, first of all, your traditional rules of etiquette and protocol are your default rules. Mm -hmm. When in doubt, they will always work. They absolutely will never offend anyone because they show the most respect. You take a risk with a more modern approach, especially where women are concerned. Another thing, when you talk about verbiage and words, that came to mind as, as you were talking, Mark, um, my mother's from the north, Chicago, and my dad's from the south. So you can imagine <laughs> the contrast that I grew up with. And I, I'll never forget this, um, talking about words. My, uh, when we got together, I would often say, I'll take you to the store. My aunt from Atlanta, Georgia, would say, I'll carry you to the store. And I thought, you can't carry me. I'm going to take you. And we go back and forth. So even between these two regions, there's a difference in verbiage as to how it's used and what it implies. So we just have to be careful. But to answer your question, uh, traditional is default. It will never offend. Uh, modern can be risky. You have to really know your audience. Mm -hmm. Melissa? I would, yes, and I would, and I would say whenever, uh, you should always, always ask, if you, especially if you have a delegation coming in, uh, please tell us the order precedence. And uh, for uh, countries where you're not, it's not immediately identifiable, uh, male, female, uh, ask for names, last name all capitalized, first name small letters, an indication of male, female, um, which I've had a conversation with my colleagues becomes a little risky because now we have people who are using uh, third gender neutral. So if they use that, that's important as well. So ask those things, always be prepared. I made an error with a, a group that came, um, a group from the UAE. Uh, my senior vice president was in the room with some other people from the university. Their assumption was that the male that they spoke to was the most senior person in the room. And I had to say, no, I'm sorry. The female, my boss, is the most senior person in the room. There was an assumption on their part, but it was also a failure on my part to say, this is the order of precedence of the people you are meeting. And so there is always that uh, need to make sure that you're asking the question in advance, especially with those delegations that are large. Uh, for our, our, our Asian delegations in particular, that order of precedence is critical. Uh, you don't give everybody the same gift. Whoever is the most senior person is going to get uh, a nicer gift, a different gift, and then uh, gifts for everybody else. It's a large delegation. So it's, a, it's critical to know who those people are when you're meeting them and, and who holds precedence in that group. So. You, you touched on a faux pas there, mm -hmm. um, and we all make them. Uh, what are some of the more common ones that you see over and over again that maybe many of us don't even know we're making? Uh, the 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 more I think again our Asian guests are always very polite to us but I think the more offensive ones are um, just uh, just taking a gift and acting like it's not a big deal I mean you need to act like there's there that's a gift and there's a reason for that gift and it needs to be handled respectfully it needs to be accepted um, graciously and 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 treated well the other thing I've seen a gentleman do even though I told them please don't do this is they take the business card and they immediately stick it in their pocket or they stick it in their back pocket and then they sit on it and that's not that's not a respectful way to treat those people that business card means something and so um, again it's this sort of Americanized way we the way we deal things we, we hand out business cards like they're playing cards we, we shuffle them across the table and there's no concern or thought about how we're treating that person um, when we're receiving them, and and so those are some those are some of the major faux pas. Um, the other thing I see is is people not being very clear when they're introducing themselves. If they're shaking hands, 
repeating their name, letting them know who they are, and being very specific about this is who I am, this is my title, this is what we're you know very pleased to meet you. Uh, sometimes we get into a rush. Again, we're not we're not creating an agenda with time, and we're getting into a rush, and it's quick shake hands around the table, sit down, and start working. And there's no uh, kind of time to familiarize yourself with the people in the room. So those are some of the ones that I see most often. All right. Can I in about the business card real quick? Melissa, you're exactly correct. Um, what I, I was taught in Japan, certainly when you hold that business card, you look at it while you're speaking to that person. Because when that person leaves, that person's soul is still in that business card. When they're on an airplane, when they're back in Japan, and you look at that business card, you must know that person. And yes, I put mine in my shirt pocket because it is close to my heart. But I was told is never put it in your wallet because it's not close to your heart. It indicates what you feel about that person. Thank you for making that point. Right. Here. And it, it is not just the putting it in the pocket. It's just that lack of looking at it and, and making sure to acknowledge it. And they just take the card and just put it away, unfortunately. While we're on business. Mm -hmm. While we're on business cards, I want to share one more piece that I think is going to be very helpful. So many business cards do not tell me the gender of the individual on that card. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult because I do want to say in a more formal way, you know, Mr., Ms., Mrs., Miss, you know, whatever the case may be. So the late Letitia Baldridge, who was my mentor, who uh, has handled a lot of state dinners, she was the social secretary for the Kennedys. I mean, her history is amazing. We, we talked about this for a while and tried to come up with a solution. And we did. And the solution is, prior to the name, in paren, like paren, M-S period, paren, and then if your name is Joe, which could be male or female, then I know that you're a woman Joe, not a man Joe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so but in, you can't put it at the end because that's where your credentials are. So in paren, before your name, if you identify your gender there, it really helps the recipient call you and address you more formally and more respectfully. Uh, the other part I think we touched on already is your last name could be the middle name, it could be the end name, whatever, but what you're starting to see more of is people will actually put in all caps which part of that component, which part of that name is your last name. For example, in Mexico, it, Mexicans would put it in the middle, and it'd be all caps, or e. Garcia, all caps, and the last name would be lowercase, that would, means that would be Senor Garcia. So that's another um, idea, especially if you're traveling abroad. Any yes, other sir. business cards? No, that's a good one. To Elva, what are some of the things that you typically see? Uh, one of the things that we do see is that when you're in a meeting and the body language of a Native American is not giving you direct eye contact or not talking at all and becomes extremely silent, it's not that we're being disrespectful. We're actually doing the opposite. We're actually giving you the respect by allowing you to speak completely and fully mm -hmm. and waiting for the door of opportunity when things are said and done to be able to express what we're saying. Um, when we're not looking at you, we're actually contemplating on what you're saying. We're actually listening to what you say. I'm not sure. I, uh, while we're on this the topic, um, I, I brought a, a, one of my my business clients to a, tr a tribal meeting. He had a, a presentation he wanted to pitch. And we talked prior to that about you know, showing people respect and we went through some etiquette. And he basically, when we got there, totally ignored it. He went through his presentation. He's a very wild entrepreneur with all sorts of ideas. And he was just like banging off the walls with all these ideas. And they loved it. <laughs> So I'm I'm guessing probably that was a group of more modern right. uh, Native right. Americans because I was offended because like, he didn't listen to what I said. Number one and number two is you know, it's like wow you know nobody's going to go after this. But you know in a way after he got done he was so enthusiastic and and ultimately loved his idea and really actually did show respect for the the audience and I think that's possibly why they continued and they actually ended up doing a deal with them. Correct. And, so, and Gloria had touched base on that earlier is that it's a hit or miss, but you're you're more susceptible to catching more flies with that by being more traditional versus uh, going modern. You it's a hit or miss when you do modern. So he was he was taking a tremendous risk. Right, he did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, that was uh, that was crazy. On the on the names, you each have talked about names, and so I'm I have a particular issue with Chinese names and characters, and I don't know whether what's a first name or a last name or how to call Japanese. I'm okay, but Chinese and Korean I haven't figured out yet. How do you how do you find out what to call the person in China or Korea? And maybe um, I don't know. Um, uh, Mark, have you, uh, I mean, Japanese, it's always, you know, last name, son. So that's pretty easy unless you get to really know the person. So that's pretty straightforward. How about in Korean and, and China and maybe some other countries where, you know, the way you address the person is very important? I ask first so I don't look like an idiot. Okay. But, but also, <laughs> one of the things also is, is I, uh, forgive him, he's American. <laughs> so all all is forgiven. Yeah. So asking the question, you know, while you're engaging them, what should I call you? Is you, I mean, do you be just direct like that? that? Very much. What what name do you prefer to go by? Okay, that sounds good. Definitely. When in doubt, ask. Always ask. Okay. And there's a sincerity that it really kind of crosses cultures, right? right. You know, that you, you know, makes, you, it makes it very personal that way. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Mark, you've probably seen some pretty exciting things with your work with the sister cities. Exciting, probably not so positive. In the, so what are some of the more common faux pas that, that you see? And then how do you correct someone? I mean, like if you're in the moment and you, you know, for whatever reason, you get surprised by something that somebody does, and it's quite a big problem. You know, what, what are some of the techniques that you can kind of make, make a lemonade out of lemons? Like like last Friday, when we had a delegation of school children from Hitachi Kita High School, and the person that I asked to give some experiences about his time uh, in Japan as well as his experience with Japanese, begins talking about the bombing of Pearl Harbor in World War II. Um, let's say this: his time at the podium was very short. After that, I hopped up <laughs> and I thanked him for his time put my hand on his shoulder. I said, what we really need to concentrate on is the last 70 years following the Great War. The United States and Japan have worked together, and that's the key word together, to build two of the strongest economies in the world. And if you look at where we've come from, blah, 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 bam, you grab it, squeeze it, throw it in the trash, and run, run the other way. That was, uh, that was most, uh, uh, almost turned out to be a disaster. Wow. Uh, so, so once again, as I mentioned earlier about it is your show, it's your meeting, you better own it. And wow, I had never known this guy was going to run toward the, uh, the invasion of Pearl Harbor. You wouldn't expect that. You wouldn't think you'd have to educate mm -hmm. anyone on that. Right. Ladies, have you, have you run into things like that, that it's like, uh oh, wow, that was a terribly bad. Let's try to find a way to recover. Yeah, we were, I was just in Boston with our protocol officers uh, group and uh, Capricia Marshall, former U.S. Chief of Protocol, uh, Ambassador Marshall was presenting and she was talking about having to be that buffer physically sometimes having to stop the president and say, you must listen to what I have to say to you before you go out there because you don't want to create an incident, you don't want to uh, create embarrassment for yourself. And um, you, you as the protocol person, uh, even if you don't have a formal protocol person in your organization, if you've got somebody who's assigned to that job, their role is to make sure that the principal is briefed. And at that point, if the principal does not take your advice and things go horribly wrong, you might have to be the person that steps up and says, I'm terribly sorry that happened, or um, please let me apologize or let me make this up to you somehow. Sometimes you have to be the person who sort of you know, falls on the sword, as they say, because it's, you want to make sure, make sure that relationship is maintained. Do you have any other <laughs> advice no, for that? Perfect. And anything else to add, ladies? Um, I'm going to add one more to the business card. Okay. <laughs> um, it's such an important document. It really is and needs to be treated respectfully and handled according to all the protocols. But one of mine is I can look at a business card and I can look at it. I can stare at it, and I can look at it. I still don't know how to say that name. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how to pronounce a name. And so in my seminars, I'm encouraging people, and some I've taken my advice, and I love it when I get this kind of card. But consider, under your name, again, using a little print thing, put the phonics. 
of your name, how it breaks down, so that when I see it, I have no problem pronouncing your name. And that could be a reason why you're not getting the call. You're not getting a call back. You're not getting the follow-up. It's because someone's challenged by your name. They're not ignoring you. They're just challenged by your name, and they don't want to embarrass themselves. So helping them out with your business card is a great way to do that. Good how boy. Many, how many books on protocol do you have? We heard about <laughs> Melissa's oh, library. I have a <laughs> lot, but probably not. Well, she's at ASU. <laughs> Come on, give me a break. <laughs> what, what, are we, what are we talking about here? Is it a wall? Uh, I mean, it... and, and in my in my line of work where I feel the most success and most gratification actually is helping those coming into this country to understand our culture. In order to do that, I have to know something about theirs. So mine are also research I research their culture to get an idea of what they expect, what they're used to, you know, what their cust what their uh, customs are. And then I say, okay, I realize this is your custom, but in our country, this is where we're going to have to meet halfway. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to be aware of. So I really do address receiving the internationals coming into our country, help them better understand. I take them on a historical walk, a timeline from 1776 forward, and that really helps them get it, to believe it or not. But that, that's my approach. Okay. There's a book that's fairly elemental but it was given to me years ago that I go back to a lot called Kiss Bow or Shake Hands. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's in what, third third writing right mm -hmm. now? Something like that. Wh which book? Kiss, Kiss, bow. Kiss Bow or Shake Hands. Ah, okay. I think it's in his third writing. Okay. But there's a, there's a lot of them. There are. A lot. You've got a big library. Yeah, talk I, about your library. I <laughs> do. Um, I, take a, I make a point of getting any kind of protocol books that I can because it, we're – challenge with getting people who are coming in or people who have said, well, I need some help. And I, I'm the first one to admit I don't know everything. There's so much to know about protocol and all the cultures and everybody that's coming to visit you that uh, if you don't have a reference, uh, you should have a, a, an online location. Again, sometimes you have to be careful about the online, uh, but find somebody. <laughs> Your best bet is to find somebody from that country or from that area and say, tell me what I need to know. Um, Again, just had a panel discussion with international protocol officers, and we said, what is the thing you need to know about receiving a visitor from your country? And our gentleman from the UAE said, have, have, have coffee, have Arabic coffee, uh, and, and you'll make your guests very happy. And I thought that's a very simple thing you can do to greet somebody and make them feel welcome. And that's something I, I don't know I've seen in any of the books that I have, So, um, but books are critical to, to that. So I must... I probably have about 30 books in my library right now. Do, do you have Can I give you an oh. example of what you just talked about, about the mm -hmm. coffee? Mm -hmm. A few years ago, we had a very high-ranking delegation from Ukraine come to our home here. And the, uh, the number one person was the, uh, the deputy prime minister. Um, we know that the prime ministers, excuse me, yeah, the prime ministers, um, company is Roshan Chocolate. Do you know how difficult it was to get a box of Roshan Chocolate? The Roshan Chocolate bars were given out to those guests when they were here. The letter that I received, the thank you letter from him, concentrated on how we had gone to the furthest lengths possible to get Roshan Chocolate. What he didn't know is that we had had two years earlier an exchange student from Venetia, Ukraine, who went to the local store and boxed them up, sent them to us. But the fact was, we paid that much attention, mm -hmm. and that's what we had. You're exactly right about that coffee as well. And, and sometimes it's the, it's the smallest thing that will make somebody feel grateful and, and welcomed. Uh, knowing something about that person before they arrive, uh, you don't have to give the big flowery gift. And I have a, con I have a conversation with other protocol um, friends of mine it, universities like to brand things. We like to put our name on everything, right? But, you know, you can only give out so many of those tchotchkes for so long. So you do need to find that special something, a special book if they're a horticulturist, if they are all about um, museums around the world, something that kind of ties you to that person that says you, you've paid attention to them and they're important. My, so, father, that, my father used to call that shine in the back of your sheet. <laughs> Those are the little details that only you know about, but will go notice. So this really goes to really what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to do business or create a relationship. And, and you've all probably experienced the time when that preparation, that thoughtfulness, that being in the moment 
the, the, the talk about the chocolate with you, Mark, has helped enhance what you're trying mm -hmm. to do, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's really why all of that is important. Definitely, that that, that personal connection, wherever you can make it, is is critical. And, I like to add on. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Like, um, one of the things that if you're unsure with your business send out a li liaison ahead of time before your meeting to get to know that tribal affiliation and their traditions so that they can come back to the company and help the business members or the board understand this is what you're stepping into and you'll have less uh, catastrophes that happen and if there is a catastrophe that liaison can repair that relationship. Sounds good. Would you guys like to make a final comment? We'll start I, I, no, I just really appreciate the time that everyone's taken. I think this is a, an area that sometimes we know is important, but we don't spend enough time on. And and so the fact that uh, folks have taken time today to join us and learn a bit more about protocol, receiving guests, sending out bound delegations, whatever it might be, uh, in the end, we'll, we'll always assist you. And so feel free to call on um, me or I would think anybody, any of us, but happy to help in any way we can. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. my, part, my parting bit of advice is if you're going to sing the solo, you better know the song. <laughs> <laughs> and we really didn't talk about foods at all, but mine would be if you're receiving a delegation from China, don't take them to our version of a Chinese restaurant, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, but sometimes, really, they want to experience American cuisine, and they'll let you know what it is they would like to experience. As simple as sometimes, at Chicago, when I was in Chicago, it was the Chicago hot dog. It was a big thing with them, so I had to take them wherever that big pickled um, Chicago hot dog was, but be very, very careful uh, with restaurant selections when you are trying to make them comfortable by taking them to a restaurant that is supposedly Chinese when it's owned by somebody totally different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any uh, food um, comments or dining? Okay. Very good. Then we're going to wrap up, and this is Doug back again. Um, the the food story that I have actually happened here at, in the Sky Song. Uh, we had some visitors from Argentina, and that actually they're working with Global Chamber and a member. And we, I couldn't attend the meeting that we had set up for them in the afternoon, but we I could do lunch. And before we left this building, they said, anything except hamburgers. I don't want hamburgers. <laughs> so I chose an Italian restaurant because it was kind of unique and, and really kind of authentic. And what I learned is that they both had lived in Italy of, and during their time, and they loved it so much. They, they spoke Italian. They started talking to the owner, and it was, like, spectacularly successful. If I would have prepared, it would have been a lot better, but it was, it was dumb luck. So sometimes dumb luck works. So I, I'd like to kind of recap what I heard, anyway, with seven tips that uh, you guys shared. Number one is, first and foremost, be prepared. You know, do the research ahead of time, and that's, I think, all of you sang that song you know, we sometimes just kind of plot ourselves into a normal meeting, not really thinking when some research solves a lot of problems. Um, and if, you, if you're in a meeting and you're confused or you don't know what to do, ask. Um, so that's number two. Uh, number three is um, treat your business, treat business cards with respect. And that's, that's a universal thing, but certainly it's very important in Asia, which includes don't write on it as well. We, we didn't mention that, but don't ever write on a, on a business card. Uh, number four, don't eat at Applebee's. I think that's what, that was that was from you, Mark. Uh, don't eat at Applebee's, and and no, <laughs> yeah, that you that might be not exactly quite right, but uh, I think your point was probably something else. Also, you mentioned and no war stories, right? You know, we have war stories in the U.S., and then there's war stories, and you don't ever want to talk about war. You know, that's not a good thing, and anytime, anywhere. And then finally, number six, uh, be sincere. You know, sincerity and really caring, and even if you're not prepared and you're sincere, it, 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 ills a, uh, it cures a lot of ills. And finally, uh, number seven, pay attention. You know, pay attention to what's happening. You know, pay attention before, during, and after. You know, so that uh, you're watching what's happening, you're getting feedback, you know, if you create a faux pas, hey, you know, it happens. It happens to all of us. And so the, the best way of creating a faux pas is, uh, or reacting to a faux pas is 
doing something to correct it. And sometimes the relationship becomes stronger because of that. Thank you all speakers. A round of applause for our speakers. Pretty quite amazing. Around the world, the, the, the clapping is coming in. <laughs> And I uh, want to thank all of you for speaking, and hopefully uh, if this video works, I would imagine we'll be posting this online, so you may already be watching this online. Thank you for attending, and continue to be global and unstoppable. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for sharing your backyard with us. <laughs>